in hopes of getting something to get around that requirement. So in this case, it'd be the Titan's Mitts or the Hammer is what I'm looking for. Okay, hold, pause the timer for a second. I gotta talk about this one. So that is the Titan's Mitts in a location that we're not supposed to be able to get to right now because we do not have the flippers. Hmm. Well, the Book of Adora is something. It's not a very good something, but it's something. This will allow us to enter the Desert Palace, and I can actually finish that. But I also could have entered the Desert, the desert Palace with a mirror. Hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and zip through the old Desert Palace, and... Oh! Oh! Okay! So that actually matters a lot more, then. So what this means is, we absolutely... Well, 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 what do we have here? Something actually for YouTube? Amazing. Yeah, I figured what I'm gonna go ahead and do is, now I'm getting some of the introductory stuff to Rando, I might go ahead and occasionally run a seed that's just for viewing on YouTube. It's like a little more truncated with some of the fluff cut out. So that's gonna be what we're doing today. <clears throat> Let me just go ahead and get a file name ready to go. So today we're gonna be playing Link to the Past Randomizer. Uh, we're gonna be just using a very simple preset of the standard casual mode. So in this case, we're starting with sword and boots. This is commonly referred to as the casual boots setting. Just starting off with something easy, so that way if people don't follow the streams and whatnot, we start with something that's not too shaken up. But yeah, uh, how standard format always works is you actually do start off with the Hyrule Castle saving Princess Zelda and all that good stuff that you would start off in the vanilla game. And with this particular version of the preset, you start off the Pegasus boots and a sword, so things go nice and smooth. And it's like there's no crazy stuff, like the entrances being shaken up or anything like that. It's just, it's just the items. And the goal is to get all seven of the crystals, so the crystal maidens, uh, climb Ganon's tower and defeat Ganon. So without any further ado, uh, let's go ahead and get started on this one. Something random just came up. Hmm. You mean something randomized? <laughs> Alright, starting off with bombs, always nice. I imagine a lot of the escapes gonna be cut out, but you know. Because <laughs> it's the escape. It's pretty similar to the vanilla game, especially since we're starting with a sword. So hey, uh, maybe this part will be in fast forward. We'll see. That's a pretty good first item for this. So a lot actually gets truncated when it comes to the randomizer experience in general. So a lot of text boxes and cutscenes and the like are actually totally removed in order to make the repeated play experience a lot better. So, for example, Zelda actually has multiple text boxes that normally pop up during this escape. But if you're playing on the randomizer, they're cut out, because seriously, if you end up playing a couple dozen seeds, even, like, just that many, you're gonna get really tired of having the same things popping up and over and over again. So it's really nice that they're, they just get rid of them. They expect you to have some familiarity with the vanilla game and, you know, how everything works. So you don't have to worry about the plot and whatnot, because if you're playing Randomizer, you're usually playing it to re-experience the game in a different fashion, rather than, you know, playing it for the first time. Though there are exceptions, some people just like the Randomizer in general, rather than the actual game, which is, is kind of how I feel with Ocarina of Time, to be honest. <laughs> Alright, so with that much done, we can actually just go ahead and get started on the rest of the game. 
So if you take a look at the map tracker in the upper right corner, you can actually see all the different areas that are currently available with this item set. And there's quite a few, starting with where we're headed right away, which is this bonkable rock up here on the ledge. So all those areas in green we can currently access. Uh, the yellow areas you can see right now are all places we can look at, but not currently obtain the items. My money's actually pretty good this early in the game. The blue areas are places I can do that are dark. So, for example, you notice how we don't have the lamp that you normally get at the start of the game. So we are currently not able to see in rooms that are pitch black. And what this effectively translates to is the only way to get the stuff out of those items I mean, out of those item locations, is to know how to proceed without being able to see. There's ways to kind of cheese a little bit of vision, but for the most part, you need to be able to see what you're doing. Oh, this is 20 rupees. The prize here on the Lumberjack Ledge is something you can obtain with the boots after defeating Agatum 1, which doesn't always happen in these seeds. In fact, in this mode, it's something like a 30% chance of being aggro required, but it's usually for different reasons. Ah, the ice rod! So, y'all might recognize at least a little bit at the start of this scene. As, uh, some of this was actually recorded for the sample video that I put up. It's a little introductory to uh, randomizers in general. Only like the first ten minutes, though. I did a very small recording of it. And we'll be into new territory pretty much as soon as we're done with Kagariko Village. Alright, so here's one of the important reasons to go to Karakuko Village early if you have this. You actually need to play the ocarina here for the weather vane like statue in the center of town in order to activate fast travel. Reasons for delaying going to Kakariko Village after coming out of escape, like we did at the start, uh, could be if you wanted to try to find the flute elsewhere before heading over this way. Or if you just wanted to find a bottle, as there's another thing that you can do there. This is one of those things. There are valid reasons for delaying going to Kakariko Village. It can be a little bit risky in case one of your, you know, fast travel items are there. But it's still important. We also found a glove and another sword in the higher chest area, like chest density areas of Kakariko Village. This gives us a few more options on the tracker in the upper right. More specifically, it's making it very close to us having to consider the Aga Tower Climb. That requires one of two things. You either need to have the Master Sword, like we do now, or you need to have a sword and the cape. As for some reason, the cape, oh, in case of Mario, is able to go beyond the barrier that the Master Sword normally cuts as part of the story. So that's just like a little, little tidbit of info right there, I guess. Alright, so unsurprisingly, I was just talking about the possibility of needing to do Aga 1. So Agatha's Tower, a place you go climb up to get sent into the Dark World in the vanilla game. And there's the lamp to put that fully. So there's the concept of logic. And what that means is, there's a certain, like, way of going about placing items that the randomizer does it. So you can always complete the entire game, and you're never put into a really awkward situation. Like, you're never going to have to go through a dark room without the lamp, etc. And in this case, it, it's just letting us know on the tracker there that that tower in the middle is fully on logic. Speaking of weird things, we're gonna go ahead and do a water walking glitch. So what this allows us to do is to, effectively, walk on water. It's a little bit of a weird setup. What you do is, in that room that we just came from, you dash out the door by dashing just like, so you're partially against the pit like that. And if you do it right, it should have to be set up in such a way where if you jump downward into the water, specifically downward, you'll land on top of it and be able to run. But I'm also coupling this with another glitch, so two for one. That setup I just did there is called a thing called fake flippers. It allows you to go into a swim state, even though you shouldn't be able to, because how the game's coding work is, is it checks for a screen transition before it checks for whether or not you had the flippers. 
So the game, not knowing what else to do from you hitting a screen transition in the water, decides, okay, you're swimming now. That's just what's happening. So by doing this, we have this. I don't always go for this trick at the start, as sometimes it's not very practical to do. But in this instance, since it's possible that we're going to have to go do Aga Tower to get to the Dark World, I'd much rather avoid it if I can, so I'm going to try to do what are called sequence breaks. So just doing things that are not in logic, but we can still do tricks for, in hopes of getting something to get around that requirement. So in this case, it'd be the Titan's Mitts or the Hammer is what I'm looking for. Okay, hold, pause the timer for a second. I gotta talk about this one. So that is the Titan's Mitts in a location that we're not supposed to be able to get to right now because we do not have the flippers. So by triggering this water walking glitch, we were able to get into here, like in a place where we don't belong and are able to open the chest because we're still technically considered walking on water. So we can get that too. But allowing us to get the Titan's Mitts. Now the flippers are probably somewhere in the Dark World. So if we can find the Moon Pearl, we can effectively skip the need to go through Aga Tower if it's required. Very useful. That's the way they can straight up save like five minutes right there. Anyways, start the timer back up and away we go. We go and get this like really niche case scenario. And there's a bow over there that I want. Okay, so having the flippers would be really nice right about now. So the old man here is actually an interesting little tidbit of information. So you may recall from the vanilla game, you're walking through the cave in this direction, and he like tries to tell you where to go, tells you a little bit about what he knows. Uh, he's actually one of the same quit points in this game, so unlocking him for that reason is kind of useful in and of itself, especially if you have the ocarina. So he goes in there, and now if we save and quit our game and go back to the main menu, we can start from his cave if we want to. Which is good, because it's, you know, the entrance is right at the front, He'll give you a full heal if you talk to him real quick. It's good stuff, it's a good spot to start. Plus it gets you up the mountain quickly if you're in a situation where that's, you know, not a bad thing. Overall, just something that's nice to have, that's why learning the, the old man save and quit cave there, like the rescue cave, in the dark is one of the nicer things to pick up early. So one thing that's important to check, and you know, I probably should have checked it before now, is what dungeons have our crystals? I take a look. We can see that Eastern is a pendant, whereas Tower of Hera and Desert Palace are crystals. So where those are placed is also randomized. So on the off chance I need anything else for Eastern Palace, this is a very greedy play what I'm doing right now. It's also very dangerous, so we are quite likely to die since if I get hit even once we just go down. This is called Waterwalk Storage, so we did this previously like you saw. Except now I'm going to attempt to do this all the way to where we saw that bow. If I get hit once, we are dead. It's just as simple as that. Thankfully, we had a fireball shield to actually protect from that one. This is the tricky part, is getting through the entirety of Zora's domain. While in this fake flipper state, without getting hit. If we just keep going fast, they'll get less shots off. I'll have a better chance of not getting hit. We also have to avoid any shallow spots like those little bits of grass, since those would cause us to land on top of the water again. But looks like we're going to be fine. Just dodge the fire there. Hop on down, we'll be walking on water, and we can grab that bow. So we're gonna go into Eastern Palace. This is most likely where our Moon Pearl is. Which will allow us to access the Dark World. Now, you notice I do have the game's music on at the moment. There is an option on the randomizer to turn off the music, if you so desire. And considering the recent um, <clears throat> adjustments to old Nintendo soundtracks, I will probably be turning off the music in the future and playing some of my own. But for now, I'm, I haven't listened to the vanilla game music in a while, so we'll go with that. Eastern Palace is very simple. There's only three items that you can get out of it in these settings. 
because of the, what the tracker's showing on there, like the number of chests beside a dungeon. That's how many items there are that are not the map, compass, big key, small key, etc. So as expected, there's our Moon Pearl. Now that would be enough in and of itself, but this isn't a race. I'm going to go ahead and see just what we'll get out of this dungeon by completing it. You know, so for some... At the moment, despite all the, like, weird glitches that we've been doing, we're progressing in a way that's somewhat vanilla. Like, we did the escape. We went through Kakariko Village. Now we're doing Eastern Palace, our first dungeon. For the moment, it seems rather tame. Okay, that makes things really interesting, actually. So the last item in the Eastern Palace was the hammer, which also allows us to access the Dark World. So defeating item 1 was not required either way, but now, thanks to our Secrets Breaks, we have the Titan's Mitts when we shouldn't. Now this gets further interesting, because this gives us more options of places to go than we're not supposed to have yet. And since we have this bow that we're not supposed to have yet, I'm very inclined to go here to the Palace of Darkness, which is also a pendant. That's actually extremely annoying. <laughs> I go out of my way to get that bow, and both the dungeons that actually require a bow are pendants. I mean, at least they had stuff I need, but still, jeez. So much like in the vanilla game, Kiki the Monkey still needs money in order to open the front door to the Palace of Darkness. 10 rupees to get him following you, 100 rupees to open the dungeon itself. So I'm gonna go ahead and check out Palace of Darkness. And we'll see if there's anything interesting in here. something. It's not a very good something, but it's something. This will allow us to enter the Desert Palace, and I can actually finish that. But I also could have entered the Desert, the desert Palace with a mirror. Hmm. The shovel as well. Interesting. So these don't really have too much purpose. The shovel is used for digging up a single item. The Book of Adora can be used to enter Desert Palace, as well as check what's on the pedestal itself, so the Master Sword pedestal. And it can get you the Ether and Bombos tablets like it does in the vanilla game, too. But of course, the item that drops from them is randomized. So it's not much more useful than the shovel. For now, let's go ahead and see if we generated a seed where I need the polis. Nope, okay. So we can leave Eastern Palace and Desert Palace the way they are. I don't I mean, and Palace of Darkness the way they are. I don't need to go back to them. That hint text let me know that it is just 20 rupees sitting up there. But for now, let's make use of the Book of Medora that we got to go into and complete the Desert Palace. There's two different ways you can enter this dungeon in the randomizer in normal settings. You either use the Book of Medora like in the vanilla game itself, where we just enter through the front door, or if you have access to the Ocarina and the Titan Smiths like we do, and also have access to the Magic Mirror, you can teleport to the left entrance from the Dark World. So it's just an interesting little wrinkle. Either way, it's just nice to finally be in a dungeon that actually drops one of the items we need to finish the game instead of pendants. I'm gonna go ahead and zip through the old Desert Palace and... Oh! Oh! Okay! So that actually matters a lot more then. So what this means is, we absolutely required the Book of Adora in order to get the Magic Mirror. So we needed to go into Palace of Darkness. So good. Both of those dungeons that we went into so far, we could not have avoided. We would have had to go into Eastern Palace to pick up the Moon Pearl and the Hammer. 
and we also would have had to go into Palace of Darkness to pick up the Book of Medora. <laughs> Alright, so the Land Molas are up next, and they're an interesting little problem with our current equipment. The best thing I had to fight them with is the Ice Rod, and its projectile is slow and unwieldy, so we'll probably need to use something other than it a little bit. Or we can just get it just fine. That works too. <laughs> You're gonna account for a little bit of weird delay. Okay, so one reason why I decided to go for the boss first there instead of checking out the rest of the dungeon is if the boss dropped the second item that's available in Desert Palace, I could have skipped going to the other side of the dungeon. Unfortunately, that's not what happened, so I need to go and grab whatever that is. I mean, I could skip it, but I'm not going to. So one thing I want to take a quick look at... The medallion you need to open the door to Misery Mire and Turtle Rock has actually been randomized as well. So I got a quick glance of it out of the corner of my eye there. It was the Bombos Medallion. So we'll need that in order to finish the game. Much like every other item, it's just hidden about randomly, so it's good to check and see which two you need, or even just one if you get lucky. That way you actually know what you're going to be requiring in order to finish the game, rather than just finding absolutely everything every single time. Alright, the hookshot is actually a very important item in Randomizer for a couple of reasons. First thing, it's just nice to have. It's the hookshot, it's a cool item. You can go to a lot of places with it. Uh, the second thing is, there is a very frustrating trick to do called hovering that's allowed in races that allows you to skip the hookshot under some circumstances. In this scene, we have a crystal that drops from Ar Argus in the Swamp Palace, so you can't skip it. But whenever that dungeon's a pendant, for example, there's a chance that you could end up skipping it because you can perform this hovering trick to pass the final gap before you get to the top of Ganon's tower. So usually seeing the hookshot's quite a relief. It's also one of the two items that lets you get to the east side of Death Mountain, which has a lot of different items in it. So usually it's like a nice high value place to head to once you feel ready. For now though, it's time for Thieves Town. This dungeon is usually pretty quick. If you have the hammer, then you can do everything in it, no problem. Just a nice, super simple place. Very relaxing. Alright, time for Blind. So Blind's an interesting sort once you've played enough scenes. If you follow the exact same pattern with your sword each time, you could actually make this fight that's normally a whole bunch of random numbers being generated, and turn it into the exact same pattern each time, resulting in a fight that looks like that, where it becomes much easier to take no damage. This is one of those things that I wish I knew back when I did the no damage run of this game in general. But that was, uh... Long, long ago, before I knew many speedrun tricks. Because <laughs> Blind ends up being one of the easiest bosses in the game once you've learned how to handle them. But either way, nothing important in Thieves Town other than the crystal. That's fine. That's one of those dungeons that doesn't get any faster, even if you have all of your items already. So it's good to just get it done when you can. Alright, so this cave, generally known as Hype Cave, and well, <laughs> it's kind of proving itself right now. This is one of the first, like, high amount of item caves that you can access as soon as you hit the Dark World. And that definitely put a few pieces of the puzzle back together for us. Because we'd been missing those flippers, which allowed us to get the Titan Smiths that I was talking about. And those Titan Smiths allowed us to... I mean, the flippers also allowed us to get the bow in the Zora area that allowed us to get through Palace of Darkness so we could pick up 
the Book of Medora, which let us get the mirror. So all that stuff has finally slid back together. We've put the scene back together, it was in pieces, but now we're all good. Now we're back on track. And also allows us to just head straight into Swamp Palace so we can do this first. There's definitely gonna be something up on Death Mountain, I don't know what just yet, but we're gonna go ahead and do Swamp Palace first. Now Swamp Palace is an interesting beast in these more standard settings. You need to have the mirror, so you can do what we just did there, which was draining the dam. In crazier modes, the dam actually stays drained after the first time you find it. But at least in standard settings like this, you have to go ahead and drain it each time you come in. So, mirror flippers at the minimum required to get this far, and then you also need the hammer, and you also need the hookshot, so... It has a lot of items that are required in order to finish it fully. It also generally has quite a few items in it, as you can see these six boxes there. And has a rather slow left-hand side area that is completely optional under most circumstances. That's an interesting thing that you can try to skip on a lot of occasions. I don't know if I'm going to do it this time, we'll see what the rest of the dungeon has. But yeah, this is one of the more troublesome dungeons to deal with in these more standard settings, because one of the biggest time saves you can make in the entire like, span of the seed is skipping that left-hand side of this palace. But if it blows up in your face, then you're probably never coming back to it until it's one of your very last things, and you've probably wasted 15 minutes instead of saving two, so such is the risk. Such is the risk. So there's several different methods to going about defeating Argus. The big thing is, the first thing you have to do is to hookshot all the puffs, get rid of them like so. Now, this phase is where things get a little crazy, because there's so many different ways to quickle it. A common method is to just spam the ice right of the corner. If you get them set up properly, it'll work better. I unfortunately did not get it set up properly, so we had to loop around the room once. If you're really stylish, you can get a whole bunch of very specific inputs at the start of the fight to destroy all the puffballs before he even does one big spin attack. But it's very difficult and very precise in terms of your timings. Now, unfortunately, Swamp Palace didn't have anything important. I can't say I'm too shocked considering where the Titans of its were earlier. So we're gonna head up to Death Mountain and probably find either the Bombos Medallion, the Fire Rod, or both. Alright, so we found the Bombos Medallion, not too surprisingly there. So all we still need at this point is the Fire Rod. And unfortunately, we did find the fourth sword. Now, the only reason why this is an unfortunate thing is because we spent that time on the left side of Swamp Palace and only got a sword for it. Which I should be going down this way. If the other sword didn't turn up somewhere easy, then it would have been worth the time investment. Because the jump from the Master Sword to the Sem Temper Sword is quite huge. But the jump from the Temper Sword to the Gold Sword doesn't do very much. There's only a couple of bosses and enemies that the Gold Sword does anything different to. So next up we have the Tower of Hera. This is always an interesting dungeon in these formats because... There's ways you can really mess with going through it. This is due to a somewhat recently allowed glitch that's referred to as Heropot. It lets you essentially skip to the top of the dungeon right away, using that pot right there. And this is one of the scenarios where you probably want to do it, because otherwise I'd have to go into the basement and sit through a very long section of waiting for tiles to be thrown at me. So what you do there is you use what's called a hook speed glitch, and you kind of essentially ram yourself into the pot, 
So they hookshot can clip you back over and you can fall into it. It's really weird. It's another one of those things that I've had to get into in greater detail. But it allows you to complete this dungeon very quickly. You can even drop down like I did for a moment to check that one chest. The only risk associated here is if there's something in the big chest itself. And it's something that you need. Because that's what you end up skipping. Since the big key to this dungeon is currently in its vanilla location at the, like, after the tile room basement. Moldarm with the gold sword, though, crazy easy, only takes two hits. And we got lucky! So we got both items out of here, we were able to do the dungeon fast and not get punished for it. So now it's a matter of choosing between Misery Mire and Ice Palace. We're gonna end up choosing Ice Palace due to another race allowed glitch that ends up making things go better. <laughs> so you know, that's a the running theme. So welcome to the Ice Palace, one of the dungeons that's the absolute most affected by Rando. For example, the Bombos Medallion, as you see here, is actually capable of defeating the Freezor enemies, allowing you to get into the dungeon proper instead of needing to use the Fire Rod. There's also a variety of different glitches and skips you can do in this dungeon to make it go much smoother. So, the Fire Rod's actually not required for very many things in this game. It's required for several rooms in Turtle Rock, because there's no other way to shoot fire while you're on those moving platforms. And it's required to get into the back of Skull Woods. But other than that, there's not a whole lot that it can do. So for Ice Palace, you can do everything with just the Bombo Stab uh, Medallion instead. So we're really hoping that the Fire Rod ends up being either in here or in Misery Mire, because if it's not, we have to start looking in some pretty awkward locations that will end up using up a bit of time. But now it's time to perform what's called Icebreaker. So yet another glitch I need to get into specifics of later, but it allows you to clip through a wall over here in this room, circumventing a lot of the traveling down to the bottom of the dungeon. So you swing your sword, to the left, a single pixel it can take a little bit of effort. Oops. Should <laughs> not cast the Bombos Medallion, I forgot to menu. <laughs> so, okay. Sword swipe once to the left, hold diagonal down right, move exactly one pixel to the left, then hold down. That may sound kind of specific, and it is. But because of this, you end up starting Ice Palace on the side of the dungeon that has all the items! Rather than having to spend a minute or so going down a section that has none. This ends up being extremely helpful, as it streamlines the whole dungeon to just go from chest to chest, and speeds it up immensely. So much like with everything else in the dungeon, the Bombus Medallion also deals with the ice shield around Cold Stair. One cast and off it goes. The Gold Sword actually does help out quite a bit against Cold Stair specifically, because it kills off the boss in three swings instead of six. Now unfortunately, the Fire Rod was not in here. But we found all three items very quickly, so it wasn't really any slower than had I come in here just to rush the boss. Because we need this crystal right here anyways, so... Good enough. Next up is Misery Mire. It's only got two items, but if either of them's the Fire Rod, we're all set. Ugh, okay, so that big key puts in a bit of a predicament. So, this would allow us to just skip everything else in the dungeon and go straight to the boss. If I had more locations left that weren't Misery Mire, I'd feel more inclined to skip the rest of the dungeon. However, it's still strategically sound to go to the boss first. Because if the boss has the item you're looking for as your final item, you still get to skip the rest of the dungeon. 
If it doesn't, then you have to go back through the first two rooms in Mire, and that doesn't take very long. So in this situation, you always go for the boss first. There's no reason not to. Vitreus is a funny one with this combination of items. Once again, the gold sword, kind of useful. Destroys all the eyeballs in three attacks. And destroys Vitreus in eight. <coughs> You can use the cape, make yourself invincible, go to town on him. And we didn't get the fire rod, so we do have to come back in. I'll be a little bit sad if the fire rod's anywhere in the locations outside of Misery Mire, because then we could have saved some time here. I'll be especially sad if it's in the one location I kind of blatantly skipped. We'll see what happens. For now, we're diving back in. We're going to try to get the two items that aren't just small keys, big keys. Compasses and maps. And if it's not in here... We'll have to move on to the next spot. <sighs> okay. There it was. Get it nice and early. We can leave. Get out of here. It's time to go finish the game. So I had this been a racing environment. I think it would have done okay. This isn't good enough for a win, because we did do quite a bit of extra spots. But I think due to getting the... Titans bits early and making the play on Palace of Darkness and all that good stuff. It would have been okay. The big problem was that the mirror didn't really lock anything other than the completion of Swamp Palace, so finding it early was less a boon and more of a time waster. The important thing is, at least, that we managed to leave a few places left behind and we can just scoot over to the final dungeons right now. So this is gonna end up ending very similarly to the vanilla game. We're gonna go into Turtle Rock, finish that up, and then head straight into Ganon's Tower and go finish that up. Overall, pretty good seed. It definitely had me thinking for a moment there thanks to the Titan's Mitz positions. Like, I was really sure the game was probably going to expect me to go defeat Ag uh, Aghanim instead of finding the hammer to get to the access to the Dark World. As that's always the thing that's kind of on your mind at the start of these types of seeds, is how am I going to get to the Dark World? Is it going to be the Hammer? Is it going to be the Mitz? Or am I going to have to go defeat the Wizard? And the worst one is always go defeat the Wizard. Although Mitz are up there too. They're kind of awkward to start the, the Dark World version of the game from. Either way, cast Bombos, let's head into Turtle Rock. I'm just going to go ahead and cruise through the whole thing, so we'll probably see you at Trinex. So, like, I realized I was talking dirty about the gold sword earlier, but this seed happened to show up where it actually shows off a lot of its better uses. So you can actually get a quick kill on Trinex using specifically the gold sword with a very aggressive from-the-back approach like this. If you do it right, then the third neck won't even try to attack even once. So we were a little too slow that time. So it did actually get an attack in. I was a little bit late on the fire rod usage is why that happened, but if you do it quick enough. And that's one of the few time saves that the gold sword can actually get. Either way, with Trinex down, we can go ahead and move on straight to the final dungeon of Ganon's Tower. <laughs> no wonder we didn't need the Quake Medallion. There it is. <laughs> that explains a lot. <laughs> Only in Randomizer you're going to find that sitting on Trinex. So you know the spiel with this one. Collect the seven maidens trapped in crystals. They release the barrier of Ganon's tower to open up the way. So the only thing we need to find in here is the big key so we can climb upstairs. It can be in any of the 22, uh, 22 locations. 
Actually, it's a 22 or 21. Either way, it's a lot of locations here in the basement area. Hopefully we can get it early, because I would like to get a nice time on this seed, but we'll see. So there's a ton of different ways you can approach trying to get the big key in this dungeon. I'm doing what's one of the more common strategies right now, which is to check that room first and then go all the way to the left side, since there's a lot of chests on the left. But there's a couple of other strategies, too, including one that's called the Dark Magician Strat, because that's who invented the thing in the first place. I ended up popularizing it thanks to using it a lot in a tournament that was held back in Spring 2017. I don't like it as much as I used to, it tends to be a little unreliable, but it's an interesting counter strat, depending on who your opponent is. Okay, there it is. It's probably a small key in here somewhere. <laughs> well, we found where all the hard containers are. Okay, so I got punished pretty hard for not going to the right when I had the chance. We did get the silver arrows out of it, but it cost us being able to finish the seed in less than an hour and a half. So that singular decision right there would have cost me a <laughs> quite a few places in a larger race, I would think. But I mean, that's Ganon's Tower for you. The end of these seeds are pure luck. You never know what's the correct route through Ganon's Tower until you've found the big key. Sometimes it's even best to just go for the worst spot in the whole tower, the entire room first. This time we got unlucky, but it's fine. We also found out where all the heart containers were, because I think we managed to get like five of them <laughs> during the basement checks, so yeah, that's, uh, that's why our health wasn't particularly high for a while there. But all that's left now is to just climb up the tower, defeat Agatha, and then defeat Ganon. The climb's always an interesting beast, because there's several different ways to go about it. You'll have many different styles of equipment when you're coming up here. You never really know what kind of state you'll be in by the end of the seed. And if you're playing wackier modes, you might end up climbing this place much earlier than you normally would. So it's important to be pretty comfortable with a large variety of equipment if you play a lot of randomizers. Just makes things easier for you in the long run. Time to defeat Aga too. This fight's always really RNG heavy. It really just depends on where he goes pattern-wise and whether or not I can handle it. So this purse pattern's actually pretty good. So I get an easy triple hit. And the second pattern is quite good too. Unfortunately, one of those hits didn't count because it hit him too close to a different one. Ew, and then we get kind of wrecked by things approaching in too similar of a time frame. So unfortunately, we took what was a good fight, made it a little bit worse, but could have been, yeah, you know, could have been better. <laughs> Next up is Ganon, and since we have a gold sword, silver arrows, this fight's gonna be a breeze. Even having the red mail, ten hearts left, I could have fully healed, but I didn't even want to bother. <laughs> There's so many different ways to fight Ganon, but the gold sword is easily the laziest way, since you only need to get six hits per phase. So let's hop right in and get this done. So this strat is unnecessarily complicated. Just constantly dash charging into him when you're high enough up where the sword will hit him but you won't get hit. It's a stylish thing. It's completely unnecessary. I like doing it because it feels good. <laughs> it's pretty much the long and short of it. I do it because it looks cool. <laughs> There's some practical purposes for it, but I mean, it just looks neat. And sometimes that's what matters the most, you know? Again, and of course, it teleports a random number of times during phase three. 
So then I equip the silver arrows. Fire one off at him. Torches go out. If you do it right, you can time the torch lighting so you can get one, two, three shots at the end. Kill him off nice and quick. So yeah, Ganis Tower is the only reason why we didn't end up getting, like, under an hour and a half, but this is still a pretty good time for the amount that we did. Overall, Amusing Seed definitely got me thinking a couple of times. <laughs> Not a bad finish time either in terms of just silliness and... <laughs> it's palindrome. <laughs> You'd buy a palindrome for a rupee? Okay, Triforce! <laughs> so yeah, as you can see, with a bunch of the cutscenes taken out, just everything meant to be streamlined nice and quick. It goes by pretty fast. It's essentially like doing, say, a run of Binding of Isaac or something a little longer, especially if you're less comfortable with the game and they generally end up taking two, over two hours. But overall, they're a lot of fun. I figured I'd do a little demonstration of a simple seed like this. It ended up being a little more complex of a seed just because of the possibilities of stuff that's allowed in races. So like the water walk shenanigans that we did. And thanks to like those silver arrows being in Ganon's tower, that bow we got from the like over near the Zora area, that was the only one that was available for getting into Palace of Darkness, technically. Technically. There's other glitches you can do to <laughs> Get into Palace of Darkness instead. We'll get to that when we get to that. But yeah! Pretty interesting overall. As you can see by our tracker, we did most of the game. There's one item left in Misery Mire. There's one item left in Turtle Rock. There's a couple of scattered ones here and there. Overall, it went pretty good. We didn't need to go into Skull Woods, but that's fine. That was very quick. And Fire Rod, thankfully, was one of the, in one of the nicer places. It would have been a little bit better if it was just hanging out in Nice Palace, but... Misery Mire, like, early on, still nice, too. Getting the mitts and the mirror a little bit early ended up being more of a problem than a help. But it did allow us to be a little more efficient, so, you know, pros and cons. In a lot of situations, getting those items early ends up benefiting you because you'd end up finding stuff that you were supposed to find later, sooner. And it just makes everything nice and efficient. You don't have to do kind of silly things that the scene might be expecting you to do. But that's the thing about randomizer. It's always a little bit different each time. And when you learn how to do different tricks to kind of mess with the game a little bit, the stuff that's allowed at least, then it gives you a bunch of more interesting choices. There's other glitches that are more substantial, but those ones kind of remove the need for the items in general, other than like, say, a bottle and the Cane of Samaria and a couple of other things that are used for breaking the game. So it's really up to you. If you're not racing these, then you're free to do whatever you want from seed to seed. I ain't gonna judge. I do some of the stuff that's not allowed when I'm not racing. It's fun. <laughs> It makes a couple of things less annoying. But yeah. Uh, I'm thinking about doing these kind of, like, highlight formats for scenes that I play on my own. Hopefully they're enjoyed. You guys, let me know, uh, let me know what, you, what you guys think. It's a little bit more delayed in terms of how I speak, just because it's, you know, it's live. I haven't written anything down. It's one of those things where it just keeps things short and to the point. We'll see how my editing style on this one goes. I have no idea 100% what I'm going to do just yet. I just know that I had fun with this one. It was enjoyable. And the pocket change sleeps again forever. What do you mean again? We never pulled it in the first place. <laughs> so one thing that's fun about the credit sequence of randomizers is it actually has the important stuff list. This will show you when you've gotten several of the things in the game. We started with the Pegasus boots, for example. So here's all your fast travel stuff. 
Your first sword's always a big one because it's just nice to be able to use the B button to defend yourself. <laughs> we had the gold sword for a while, so most of our bosses suffered through that. Okay, yeah, it is 22. It's been a while since I've ran a standard seed, I'm sorry. <laughs> How many times you bonked with the Pegasus boots? Your saving quids, deaths, fairy revivals. How much time you spend in the menus? Well, it's kind of on the slower side. That makes sense. I'm used to using something called Quick Swap. And of course, there are 216 item locations in the game. This lets you know how many of them you have checked. 177 is definitely on the quite high end for one of these seeds. This is what happens when I end up having to do the entirety of Ganon's Tower, pretty much. But yeah, hello YouTube, and goodbye. I don't know when precisely this will get posted, hopefully you'll be enjoyed, and you'll probably be seeing more of these in the future of different styles of seeds, too. Yeah, this is fun. <laughs> I still like our time. 131, 31. We'll catch you guys next time. I think next time I might dig into some of the different presets for both games of Link to the Past and Ocarina of Time. But until then, see ya!